Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here today. Haven't we been blessed with some lovely fall weather? We had some a really nice day this week in the latter later part of the week. Kind of temperate and mild, just lovely. But every day is a blessing from God. Snow, rain, shine, every day is a blessing. And I'm blessed to be here. I hope you're blessed to be here to worship God today. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Here in just a few moments, we're going to be reading some verses from that text. And before we do that, I'd like to take an opportunity to just recap a few things that we've studied this quarter in the book of Romans. And also remind you, if you've not already, please take a card from the pew in front of you. Fill out that card, members. Uh, you have a side in black. Guest, you have a side in blue. And guest, please put that card in the collection plate as it goes by as you're offering today. As we've studied through the letter to the Christians in Rome, written by the Apostle Paul, we've noticed a number of things. We've noticed the emphasis that Paul places on uh, the power of the gospel, the power that we obtain through belief in that gospel, in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Our place as Christians in response to that gospel. And last week we began to look at uh, this la last portion of this great letter that Paul wrote that begins in chapter 12 and goes through chapter 16 where Paul applies all of the things that he has taught to the Christians in Rome. And so we noticed last week in our study of chapter 12 the way that we are members of one body. And God has given each of us gifts. And together we use those gifts for God's glory. And when we do that in harmony, we come together like the pieces of a puzzle to form an image crafted by the Creator God. That was a powerful message that Paul taught me in Romans 12. And today, as we come to chapter 13, in the Bible class, we considered submission to authority, and there are a lot of questions surrounding that issue, and we got into some great discussion. Maybe we didn't cover everything we would have liked, but that's okay. Uh, we, we learned, I hope, about God about his sovereignty, and also about the way that we submit to him and to human authority. Now that's the first half of chapter 13. We're going to focus in this morning now on the latter half of this chapter. In verses 7 through 10, or 8 through 10, excuse me, Paul talks about fulfilling the law through love. And I want us tonight uh, to consider, uh, this is a shameless plug, uh, the debt of love that we owe to one another. We're going to talk about that in the 2 o'clock hour, so please come back, fellowship with us, and worship with us in that hour. But this morning, we're going to see what Paul says here in chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. I'm going to read that now. Please read along with me. Romans 13, beginning verse 11. Paul says, Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now earlier in the book of Romans in chapter 8, Paul hints at the idea of the end that is coming. That Christ is going to return. He uses the word groaning in chapter 8 to kind of discuss that. But now that we're in the application portion of this great letter, what does it mean for Christians? What does it mean for us to understand that we're living in the last times? 
We're living in the expectation of the return of Christ. Well, Paul gives us some application here in these verses that I'd like for us to consider together this morning. Paul says, wake up! I hope you weren't asleep. Wake up! Because the day is coming. The night is far gone. And you need to do some things. First of all, Paul says, wake up because salvation is near. Wake up because salvation is near. Now, as we jump into this discussion, we've got to understand a little bit of the background. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to go in too deep. But we do need to understand this. That in Paul's day... The Jews had a number of beliefs. Some of those beliefs came from Scripture, and some of them did not. And the Jews in Paul's day understood that when the Messiah came, the Anointed One of the Old Testament Scripture, when He came, that the final period of human history would begin. And they understood that based on a number of scriptures, probably most notably a couple from the prophetic book written by Isaiah. Now, like I said, there were some beliefs that the Jews had that didn't come from scripture. But we know that Paul is inspired, and we know that the Old Testament is inspired. And so if the Jews had a belief that came from the Old Testament Scripture and it's present in the New Testament Scripture, obviously that belief is a truth from God. And in this case, the idea that when the Messiah came, the end would come soon after is true to the Old Testament and it's reaffirmed in the New Testament. And Paul reaffirms it here. He says, the day is coming. What does he mean the day is coming? Christ is going to return. The light of the world is coming back. And the darkness will be over. But Paul's not the only one who says this. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. John says, It is now the last hour. It is the last hour. What does he mean? We're in the final period of human history. What does that mean? Well, guess what? No more prophets are coming. Of course, Jesus was more than a prophet, but he was God's final prophet. Hebrews chapter 1 and the first few verses makes it very clear that in times past, God spoke to us in various ways. But now he's spoken to us through his son. Jesus was not only the son of God, he was the last prophet of God. No more prophets are coming. We're in the last period of human history. And so Paul says, wake up. Wake up. The night is leaving. The day is coming. Wake up. Now Paul's not suggesting that we can understand exactly when Christ is going to return. But Christians will not be surprised when Christ returns returns, we will be prepared because we'll be awake. We won't be asleep. We'll be awake. Each and every day that we're alive, we're one step closer. That's what Paul says. He says, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Every morning when you wake up, do you thank God for another day? And do you know that you're one step closer to eternity? We're one step closer to Christ's triumphant return. We're one step closer to the darkness passing away and the sun shining forever. We're one step closer to salvation. Now I need to make this clear. We've looked at a number of verses throughout our study of this great book, Romans And God has laid it out for us. He sent His Son Jesus to die for us so that we could be saved. So that our sins could be washed away. So that when we stand before Him on the judgment day, we'll be covered in the blood of Christ and His righteousness will be in effect for us. But our salvation is not complete until that day. Because we've also talked about at great length in our study of this book, 
that as long as we live in this time, as long as the night has not yet gone, we struggle in the flesh. We fight against temptation, against sin. But Paul says, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. So you better wake up. Don't go to sleep because Jesus is coming back. Wow. Wake up, Paul says. Salvation is near. You ever been excited about something? Think about a child on Christmas morning. Don't children wake up before the sun on Christmas? They're expectant. They're excited. They can't wait for everyone else to get up. Christians, it's Christmas morning. Christ is going to come back. There's no time for sleep. We're too excited to sleep because the sun is going to rise. It's going to be daytime. The night, the dark night, full of sin, full of tragedy. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It's, it's going to pass. Paul says, wake up. Salvation is near. And what does that mean for us? What do we have to do as Christians because we know that the night is passing and the day is coming? Well, one thing that Paul says we've got to do is to put on armor of light. Put on armor of light. Notice what Paul says in Romans 13, beginning in verse 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now Paul was raised in Jerusalem at the feet of the rabbis. He was very well acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures. For him, the only scriptures at that time that existed given by God. And several times in his letters, Paul uses this figure of armor. He uses it in the passage that Brother Roy read from this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He uses it here in Romans chapter 13. He uses it also in Ephesians 5 and verse 10. And you can go ahead and turn there because we're going to read from that passage in just a moment. But several times, Paul refers to this armor that Christians wear. But like I said, Paul was very familiar with the Old Testament Scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 17, God wears this armor. So Paul didn't make this up. This is God's armor that we're putting on, Paul says. He says, put on armor of light. What's that armor look like? Well, we can turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, and we can read what Paul says there about this armor. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Okay? The day is coming, but we're still in the night. We're still presently in the darkness, Paul says. Stand against these powers in this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Paul says you put on the armor. The day has not yet come. And here in Romans 13, Paul says, the armor you put on is armor of light. Now I want you to think about that figure for just a moment. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We understand that in Jesus' mind, in Paul's mind, we live in a dark world. All of a sudden, that figure of light becomes a bit more noticeable, doesn't it? You see, we got electric lights. The sun's up. You don't notice the electric lights. The sun goes down. 
you really rely on those lights. Paul says we're living in darkness, but you're to put on armor of light. Guess what, Christians? You glow in the dark. You glow in the dark. How? When you put on armor of light. Armor to face, to fight, to wrestle against the evil powers. You see, yes, uh, this, this past weekend, Friday, this great tragedy, this terrible thing that happened in Paris. We're praying. It shook our world. It's a thing of the night. Christians, we're fighting in a battle, but we don't take up bombs. We don't take up automatic weapons to fight for our God. Mm -mm. We put on armor of light. We carry a sword of truth and a shield of faith. We fight not against physical things. We fight with the truth. We fight using the truth of God and His Word, using the great message of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, you know, I probably say that almost every week. I guess I just got a lot of favorites. That's okay. Romans 12. We, we spent some time in Romans 12 last week. We didn't get to really hit on these verses. But Romans 12, beginning in verse 20, notice what Paul says. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Ouch. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Oh, I got a long way to go, friends. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Verse 21, this is where it really brings me to my knees. Do not be overcome by evil. You know, it's easy on days like Friday to be overcome by evil, isn't it? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good with armor of light, with the truth of God, with the message of His Son, Jesus Christ. Put on armor of light, Paul says. Put on armor of light. Wake up! The night is almost over. The day is at hand, Christian. And when you wake up, when you jump up, out of your spiritual stupor. The clothes you put on are armor of light. Wake up and walk as in the daytime. Wake up, walk properly as in the daytime. The thief loves the night. The criminal loves the dark. But for the Christian, this world is not dark. For the Christian, we have already seen the light that is coming. We know that nothing is hidden. That's what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. He says that nothing is hidden from God, that he sees it all. Hebrews 4 and verse 13, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, for the Christian, the day, the day is already here. The daylight is shining. So live your life, not as though this is a dark world. Live your life with the knowledge that the sun has risen, with the knowledge that God sees everything, with the knowledge that it is light and not darkness that has control over this world. See, they say that character is what you do when nobody's watching. It's who you are when nobody else is around. But for the Christian, we know that someone's always watching. We know that we cannot hide in the dark. And once again... Paul shows his Jewishness here. I'm not saying there's anything against that, but this idea of walking. Several times in his writings, Paul refers to this idea of the walk. The walk is the way you live your life. 
Ephesians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, Galatians 5, verse 16, Paul says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk as in the daylight. Don't feed your physical desires. Feed your spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Walk as though it is daytime. Walk properly as though it is already day. And what does that walk look like? Well, Paul describes it here in Romans chapter 13. He describes the walk. And he describes it in negative terms. And what I mean by that is sometimes we say do this or do that. But sometimes we've got to get to the point. Sometimes we say, you don't need to do this. And Paul's pretty clear about it here in Romans 13. He says, do not, do not participate in orgies and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in quarreling and jealousy. The Christian doesn't walk that way. Now I looked up what these different words mean. And I want to look at them just for a moment. Orgy goes back to uh, a, a feast or a festival uh, when the new wine, when they had finished the harvest. And we're talking Gre Greco-Roman culture, not Jewish culture. And they had all this wine on hand. And so there was dancing and partying in the streets. Sound familiar? Mardi Gras? St. Patrick's Day? New Year's Eve? Christian, you don't walk in the darkness. You don't participate in those things. Drunkenness, plain as day. You know exactly what that means. I don't have to go there. Then he says, not sexual immorality. The word there originally meant simply the marriage bed. But in this context, it means an abuse of that. So it means participating in things that were meant only for a husband and a wife. That's as PC as I can be. And then sensuality, which sounds awfully similar, means that you're doing things that should only be done in private. Okay, so it, it, there's a public nature to the sexual immorality may be hidden, still wrong. The sensuality is done on display. Okay, that would include pornography. That would include a, a going to a movie or a play where lewdness was being shown. Christians, you don't do that. You don't walk in darkness. Wake up! You walk as in the daytime. And maybe those things touched on something, some temptation that you have, but probably for you and me, for me, most likely, it's these last two. Quarreling. You know what that word means? Looking for a fight. Ever know somebody who was just looking for a fight? Ever know the Christian who's always got something that's wrong with something in the church? That's quarrelsome. And then this other one, jealousy. You know, that's a really cool picture. The word jealousy in Greek is the same word for zeal. And it was an onomatopoeia. You know what I mean when I say onomatopoeia. Bang, boom in English, onomatopoeia. In Greek, that word, zelos, that was their way of saying boiling over. And so jealousy and zeal is when your emotions inside you bubble over. And in, it's a good thing when your emotions bubble and boil over in fervor for serving God. That's zeal. But jealousy is when you look at what someone else has and your emotions boil over because you want it. Because you wish you had it instead. Christian, you don't do that. You're not in the dark. You walk in the light. Wake up. Christ is coming back. You got to be ready. Walk as though the light is already here, Paul says. And he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, typically we would say that means be baptized because we have a number of places in the New Testament that describe baptism as the putting on of Christ. You go over to Galatians. You can go back to Romans 6. But Paul's speaking here to Christians, so what does he mean? 
He means you live like Christ lived. Simple as that. Christ is your all in all. You see, all of those sins, the quarreling and the jealousy and the sexual immorality and the sensuality, all of those sins are an attempt to fill some void in our lives. But Christ fills all in all for the Christian. You put on Christ. He fills you up. He fills every need you have. Put on Christ. Walk as though it's the daytime already. Christian, wake up, Paul says. You know it's time. When I lived at home during the week, an alarm clock woke me up. 6.15 every morning. I had the same alarm clock from the time I was like six to the time I graduated high school. Never forget that sound. <coughs> now my alarm clock makes some other weird noise. But on Sunday mornings, Mom got me up. And so one morning I woke up. It was a little after 7 o'clock, and I just flipped. I was like, oh boy, I'm going to miss the bus. I'm rushing around, throwing on some moderately clean clothes, trying to get my hair brushed and my teeth brushed, trying to get out the door, run into the kitchen and grab something on my way. Hopefully the bus hasn't left me, and I see Mom standing there in her church clothes, cooking, and it dawns on me. It's Sunday. I can sleep for another hour. But when Mom comes to get me up... I better be up. You know what I'm talking about. Paul says, Christian, wake up! The sun is about to rise. Salvation is near. Put on your armor of light. The sun's going to come. Until then, you've got to show light to the world. And walk as though the day has already come. Wake up. If you're not already a Christian, Christ is going to return. And you don't want Him to come like a thief in the night. You want to be prepared. And you can be through Jesus Christ. Knowing, believing that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died, buried, and was raised for you. You can turn away from your life of sin, confess His name, and be buried with Him in the waters of baptism, rising to walk a new life. And you can prepare yourself for His return, His glorious return. What a great day it's going to be when the sun rises on this dark earth. And if you're already a Christian, and you've fallen asleep, you've been sleeping on the job, you need a return. Come back to Christ. Come back to your church family who loves you. Put on your armor of light. Confess your sins before your brothers. And He is just. He will forgive you as we stand and sing together.